<laughs> Hello everyone. Back in our podcast. So today we continue the last podcast when we stopped still about Egyptian scammers. And Amira prepared for us something very amazing. She has a lot of things to tell us. So Amira, let's go on. Yeah, so last week we discussed um, our opinion on uh, scammers in Egypt and what we thought about it. And we we did cover um, some important topics like the Orphe marriage and the red flags surrounding that. So I thought it would be uh, really beneficial for any women in particular that are listening in on uh, some topics you may want to discuss with your partner before you become uh, official marriage. So that way you can protect yourself against any potential red flags or marriage fraud or financial scams. And to just basically have like more of an understanding uh, from a cultural output of what to expect uh, from both sides, because this will be beneficial to your partner as well, of what you can discuss together to ensure that you have a more happy union where you're both on the same page, especially if you come from completely opposite countries of East and West. I agree. So, yeah, so yeah it's, so, it's so beneficial. Um, so I call this the before marriage talk, and I actually wrote um, a big article about it, and uh, it did help a lot of women, and I think talking about it will make things a little bit more clear. And I also want to say before I discuss anything further, there are always exceptions to the rule. I do not let anything that I say from here on out in the podcast is based solely on uh, my personal experience and from what I have seen over my seven years living in Egypt. And that, you know, this is not saying all Egyptian men are going to do this. They're not all like this. There's always an exception to the rule. Just because maybe one of these things might be happening to you that I'm about to talk about, it does not necessarily mean that he is, you know, trying to pull one over on you or that you have a bad guy because there's always, you know, exceptions to the rule. However, overall, it is more difficult. I believe that there's exception, but in the same time, I don't want to think all the women who listen to us they will think about themselves now that they are the exception, you know? Like, I want to yes. forget the woman that their exception can happen. Like, let's go for the rules. Yeah. Overall, basically, what we're going to be talking about will not be the exception. And the exceptions are very, very teeny, teeny, tiny percentage. Yeah. Like, so, let's say 2% of all Egypt can be the exception. Yeah. Maybe even less. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so one of the most important topics that you would probably want to talk about with your uh, Muslim slash Egyptian slash Arab husband would be um, polygyny. And a lot of people do confuse polygyny with polygamy. And uh, polyg- polygamy refers to marriage between multiple individuals. And it's sometimes called a plural marriage. And polygamy allows both the men and the women to have multiple partners in uh, their relationship. Polygyny, however, only pertains to the man being able to have multiple uh, partners. So in Islam, a man can legally have up to four wives. And this is important for you to talk about. So uh, yeah, but it's important, but it's very hard to pick. I mean, you choose, I guess, the most hardest topic on start, you know, like a lot of women disagree with this. And I I know that a lot of women even forced the man to write a contract with her that they will never marry another woman on her. But it's absolutely bullshit, let's say, because even he writes you this paper, he can still marry on you, whatever contract yeah, he sign you. That's, I was going to say that too. And you're Sorry. absolutely, <laughs> abs- no, no, you're absolutely right. And that is a very good point that it doesn't matter really, in Egypt anyway, I'm not aware of the laws of the other countries. But in Egypt in particular, you can write that. It's not going to mean anything. He can still do what he wants. So yes, it's exactly. just important to just discuss it. You don't have to like polygyny. And if you do like polygyny, good for you. You know, if whatever works for you that makes you happy, I don't judge anyone how they want to live because I do have friends that are in a polygynous marriage and they are so mm-hmm. happy and that's their business. And I, it doesn't work for me, but I don't judge other people. But it is important that if it's something that you don't want to do, that you should discuss with your partner. And it, as long as you feel like, He's on the same page as you. You can move on. Yes, possibly. <laughs> yes. Yeah, possibly. <laughs> like, but this case is on the start, you know, not after the marriage long time because it will be too late. And especially when the children will be included into your life. So yeah. do it as soon as possible. 
it's it, yeah it, exactly it's just something to be aware of especially if you are um not someone who has any education of, of islam because i have met women that don't know much about it and don't know that men here can have four wives mm -hmm. so it's just good to know that that is a possibility um i guess the next the next topic would be of course you want to talk about children um does he want okay. children how are they going to be raised uh are they going to stay in egypt and if so what school are you going to send them to because you know well, egypt does have different no, systems of that mm, yes basically i believe if the man is a muslim so as long as he's in the religion he wants his children to be raised in the same religion i believe so on the same principle and if the wife is for example in another religion i still believe he will include his own mother to this point of behaving the kids are you talking about religion yeah religion oh i was <clears throat> i was speaking about school oh school um, okay <laughs> before i met way. my husband no no because i was get that's actually part of what i was going to say um before i met my husband oh i'm sorry during when i met my husband when we were uh discussing marriage one of the topics i talked to him about was you know when we have a daughter or a son okay. what school are we going to send them to because some egyptians will send their children to a local school like mm -hmm. a public school and that's not something that is uh considered great in egypt it's a very low form of education here unfortunately not like in america where public school is free and it's nice and you're going to get yes. a good standard here it's it's very bad so you know i wanted to make sure that we were on the same page sending our kids to like an international school so they get like multiple languages they get more education a higher standard of education where they can achieve going to a good university things like that so we did talk about potential schooling and yes religion of course you know if i was a christian i'm not i'm muslim but if you are a christian woman um having children with a muslim man you should understand that majority of the time the children will be expected to be raised muslim mm -hmm. so that is something that you should be aware of yeah i agree is this really what you mentioned about the school is very interesting because uh so little women know this actually that the local school are actually very bad and you have to put your children to the pay school to be on the same level as in your country in the local because for example i was going to local school normally in my country right in europe but it was in the yeah. same grade as here you pay the most expensive school yeah it's it's about the same with the american standard as well and yeah. i didn't understand that until after you know several years of living in in egypt and meeting friends that had children that were going to mm. schools here and then i i became more aware of the circumstances uh, revolving around that and uh international school here i mean if you're not sending your kid to a public school you're going to be paying a lot of money that is one of the things about egypt that i guess i don't like is how expensive it is for, you yes know, i agree but as educated. you know that egypt make a good business with the children because for example we pay even the giving birth you know and the hospital we pay and everything the care for the child we pay there is no help from the state it's true Yeah. But there are some like other positivities about the country, you know. So this is only one of the negative things, but it's not that horrible. Uh, a lot of people. Yeah, it's managing... not like the worst thing. Yeah, yeah. all Egyptians are managing it quite well, I believe. And I I know in some European countries they do have free healthcare. In America, unfortunately, we don't have that unless you are at a um, you make like under a certain income and you get Medicaid. But if you don't have that, uh, the average cost of childbirth in America is around ten to twelve thousand U.S. dollars. Uh here in Egypt when I gave birth it, it cost maybe like $1000, $1500 maximum. That's for everything. So yeah. as an American I I truly could not complain about the the healthcare that I received here and it was high quality healthcare from mm -hmm. uh, a, a private hospital. Yeah. But um anyways going back uh to the topic <laughs> yeah, um Yeah, let's go back. <laughs> yeah, um if you're unable or unwilling to conceive I think it's important to talk about that with your uh potential spouse as well because you need to be able to determine, you know, if he would divorce you in the future because of that. Would he take another wife because of that? Because it's not uncommon for some uh Muslim men to marry another wife if the first wife cannot conceive. And uh you know, would he stay with you through thick and thin or would he, you know, just abandon you? And it's important to know that if he is a young man, and you know say you're an older woman 
it would be, uh, it's hard to be sure whether or not he would change his mind about having children in the future. A lot of Egyptian men have the reputation of abandoning a wife or marrying another one down the road, and they suddenly change their mind about having kids. So this is a risk you are willing to take, and only you can really determine your husband's character and how likely it is that you think you may or may not be a victim in the future. So that is a really good thing to think about um, if you are an older woman with a younger man, or if you are maybe you're both the same age, he's 45, let's say you're 45 or whatever, and uh, you are, you know, you can't conceive anymore. Maybe he might want kids in the future, if, especially if you're his first wife, he hasn't been married before. Maybe he will change his mind when he gets a little older. You never know. This is something that you have to think about. Yeah, but honestly, I mean, the women who are searching for like, older women, they search not for Most love. Most are not love, simply. Yeah. They search for a profit. It's a money or gain out from the country. It's the two main profits what they can gain from this old woman. But of course, every Egyptian man uh, loves to have children and wants to have children and more than one. Yeah. It's honestly, most people will tell you it is a giant red flag if you're with an Egyptian man that says he doesn't want kids or you're with any Arab man that says he doesn't want yeah, kids. Yeah, I agree. I mean, everyone's going to look at it like a red flag. I mean, whether they say it to your face or not, that's what they're thinking. And right now we're just saying what everyone else is thinking. <laughs> so... Yeah, we have to think about but, it like they grew up here in Egypt, right? And they grew up in this mentality that simply they have to marry and they have to uh, bring a kids, you know? So yeah, they are... and family here is everything. This is a very family oriented culture. Yes, family is on the first place. I agree. I say it all the time. Absolutely. <laughs> family <laughs> and religion are like the first and foremost. And that's what I like in uh, Egypt, no. you know? That they don't prefer yeah, the too. job. They, they prefer a family. Yeah. Yes, and that's uh, perfect for, for women, uh, you know, that want to be traditional. I love being traditional, so it's perfect for me. Exactly, but uh, on, the other side, on the other side, if uh, some women, for example, want to build a career and not want to care about the family so much, so I believe the Egypt is not for her. Like, don't go for Egyptian men if you are the one who want to be independent woman. This is not the country for you, absolutely. Yeah, I think like overall, most Egyptian men in general um, do prefer a more traditional wife. However, uh, there are some like my husband's family, for example, that I'm literally the only woman in the family who doesn't work and all the women in his family do. And mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, the women who work and this is important to know if you are a working woman you will still be expected to do all the traditional parts of the marriage as well. So don't yeah, think yeah. just because you have a job and he has a job that you're both going to be cleaning the house and taking care of the kids. Of course, there's exceptions to this, but I mean, overall, like they see childcare and, and household responsibilities for the women only. But you know what I like Even on the Egyptian men that most of the Egyptian men doesn't force to work or do the woman to work. You know, that uh, most of the men let it like the choice for free. Like if she want to work, work. If she doesn't want, okay, stay home. Yeah. At least Unless he's trying to scam her, then they'll persuade her to get a job like my ex-husband tried to do. Yeah, scammers. <laughs> okay, scammers, no. Scammer will tell you, go work and I will sit in the home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then, well, you go to work and you pay for everything and you bring me a visa and you bring me this. And yeah. Yeah, stay away from those. You know, there's an important point that uh, in Egypt, when the men and women are going out, so the men must pay for everything. If the women pay in front of the men, so it's a shame here in Egypt. They also it, Yeah, that of... is a shame. No respectable Egyptian or Arab man is going to be asking his woman for any money or even allowing her to pay for anything. For him, that's like a shame, not only just because of his religion, but like it's an offense to his manhood as well. Yeah, exactly. He's the man. He must do it. You know, he must care. He must. He provide. has to do it. You are the woman. You must be the pampered one and comfort one and enjoy your time. I mean, I myself, you know, even if I was an independent woman, with the knowledge that I have of the religion here and the culture here, I would understand that if I was with the man who was expecting me to pay for something, that that's not normal. And I knew that when I was with my ex-husband, that that's not normal. It's, it's something frowned upon. I'm with someone who's considered an undesirable for marriage in this culture. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, we all learn from our mistake, Avira. 
Yeah. Because, see, like, in Europe, I, you know, I was it's certainly learning experience. Yeah, but you know, in my country, if I go date a man, okay, so the first date he pay, and the second, I have to pay like a woman, like I have to rebreak him. But it doesn't work here in Egypt. Simply here, the men pay all the time for everything, just he. Absolutely. And of course, there will be some, you know, there are Egyptian families who are, you know, lesser financially privileged, where the women do have to work because they have to put food on the table. But mm -hmm. be aware that in, in these type of families, this woman is willingly and knowingly forfeiting her rights and, you know, as a Muslim wife and in, in the eyes of God and in Islam, this is considered a very big act of charity on her part because God says any yes. little bit of money that the woman decides to spend on her husband and house and everything is like a very big act of charity for God. Yeah, I agree, absolutely. That's true. So if you're forfeiting your rights willingly, and knowingly, that's a totally different story. That's up to you. But I really do believe that when you're approaching a relationship with an Egyptian with a Western perspective financially, like going in on the bills 50-50 and things like that, you could be potentially putting yourself in harm's way for financial scams. Mm. Of course, it's a different uh, topic if they're already married, for example. So, and the man, for example, has a bad time. Okay, so if the woman help him, it's okay. In the married couple, it's fine, I believe. If yeah, this at home. But before marriage, no way. I will never do it. Yeah, absolutely. And um, the men here, you know, they're responsible for basically all the household bills. This includes the home the food, the school fees, the clothing. Yes. And if Every she single. does work, her money is hers. He cannot ask her for any of that. It would be considered haram. And also his money is hers. So <laughs> at the same time, she's making all this money and you know she's saving up or maybe she's buying a Gucci bag. I mean, who knows? And he's still working and he's paying for all this. So this is why I always find it so funny when Westerners look to the Middle East and they see... Um, Muslim women as oppressed when actually mm. it's the men that are more oppressed because they're the ones like working their asses off day and night to provide because their money isn't even theirs. They are responsible for their wife, their kids and every single penny of their needs, all of it. And the women can choose to stay at home and be a queen or she can go and she can work. It's literally her decision. Yeah, and you forget, I mean, for example, as my husband, as he has a mother and my husband has three sisters so he is responsible for them as well yeah if they're head of household absolutely uh yeah. my husband uh he's also like responsible for the family and everything like that too so I mean not really so much financially because they're okay but I mean like as far as like family like um decisions you know something that affects the whole family you know he's mm -hmm. going to be responsible for that so that's you know yeah. men are head of household here that's just how it is a uh, simple and short way, the men are fucked up here. Everything what they earn, they give to us. Let's see it like this. It is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just like uh, they don't really get anything and everything is for the women. So I, I personally don't see uh, Muslim women as oppressed, you know, if, if their rights are being met religiously. If they're with someone who is giving them their rights, they're not going to be oppressed. But no, of but course, there's going to be bad and, and good in every religion. So. Exactly, it's a point again of education and religion. And again, we are both exactly. simply married, educated exactly. man, and clever man. Fine, what's and next? going back to, yeah, yeah okay. Um, I have uh, amenities and standard of living. This was another thing that I discussed with my husband prior to marriage. Like, are we going to have a similar standard of living that I'm accustomed to? Is it going to be lower and unadaptable? Uh, you know, because the, each area of Cairo or Egypt can often feel like a different country and there's going to be different standards of living in different areas, different cultural habits, traditions, dress, uh, mm -hmm. all kinds of different, you know, factors to take into account. So I wanted to know, like, how are we going to live? Am I going to have an air conditioning? When we have a kid, can I get, you know, a crib or can I buy a high chair? Because some men here uh, and some families here, they don't, use these things in their house some people don't have air conditioning here. some people don't have an elevator in their building and some people they they see buying a crib or you know a stroller or a high chair mm -hmm. things like that are not necess you know is not necessary you don't need these things so you'll be having a baby and you'll be carrying it 
you know, instead mm-hmm. of like in the stroller as a Westerner that we're used to. I mean, literally I talked about every single little detail before I married my husband. So I would know exactly what we were getting into down the road. I don't want to like marry someone and then later be like, oh no, you cannot have stroller. You must carry baby on your head. Yeah, no, <laughs> you have to talk about every little thing. Marriage here, when you, when you discuss marriage, it's literally like an interrogation. <laughs> it's an interview process. Yeah, I agree. Look, I personally didn't discuss anything, so I know how it's difficult. So I admire that you did, and you are right. It should everything. Be yeah, really because good. I've met women that are like married to a guy living in a village, and there is nothing wrong with how they live in a village. Okay, I'm not disrespecting how any Egyptian lives in in their area. Everyone is entitled to what they what they want and how they live is respected. But mm-hmm. as a Westerner coming from a certain uh, background, a certain area, like a certain standard of living, it can be really hard to come to Egypt and like go to a village and then adapt living without the things that you're used to having back in your country. And not everyone knows how they live here and they just come here on a whim and then find themselves in an unadaptable circumstance. And it can be very, very tough and even you know end your relationship because you are unable to da- adapt to his standard of living that'll break a marriage if something as insignificant as that i agree absolutely agree well yeah and the, you know the culture and the, the traditions and the status of women might be you know backwards to you if you are you know, uh, interested in marrying a man that's from a local area or a village, it might be like a totally different world. Whereas if you find someone that's more um, worldly, I guess, or someone that's more, has more life experience and, and more education, <clears throat> as a Westerner, you might be able to relate to them a bit more. However, mm-hmm. there's always exceptions and I'm not putting down someone for having, you know, a lesser privileged background. Mm, again exception yeah there is Amira I agree but still it's too little too little I just don't want anyone to feel like I'm financially shaming anyone I'm just trying to give it to uh the perspective no we speak of, the truth you know, you know how it's in Egypt because most of the girls of course come here to Egypt they fall in love with each man and they just look his beautiful eyes and the promises and the love words what he tells tell her but they forget to see the reality a little bit You know, you have to and think about surprised the so much how the man lived from which came in, family he came from, and yeah. like this, and there is no way back suddenly, and she doesn't know what exactly. to do. Exactly, you have yeah. to talk about the kind of family he came from. You have to talk about how does he live, where is he from, what area, how is that area perceived by Egypt in general. You, I mean, there's so many aspects that go into it. It's not like if I'm in America and I'm in Louisiana and I'm talking to a guy from I don't know Florida or whatever. It, it's not going to be an issue for me to like fly to Florida on a whim and be with him forever because we're in my country and I already know the standards of living everywhere. Egypt is different. The standards of living vary from yeah, area Yeah, absolutely area. different. It's a different country. It's not world's country or uh, I don't want to insult this country, absolutely, but no, but it's absolutely different world. Really, worlds which you have never seen in your entire life. Nothing seems Right. Like There's America, some neighborhoods here Europe, like it's all about the ghosts and the donkeys and, you know, the camels. <laughs> and yeah. uh you know the winding alleyways and no elevators and even the way how to walk on the street amira you know the people doesn't speak about it dress. every exactly. day when i walk on the street i think about it i have to make a video how to walk in egypt on the street because it's so complicated really you walk between it the guys <laughs> and the guys yeah. and the yeah. people <laughs> Oh my God, that is like one of the, the challenges I'm always facing every day with yes. my, my baby in the shoulder. And I live in Zamalek, which is like one of the most westernized areas in the whole country. And even I'm facing these issues. And I know for a fact, because I've lived in non-expat areas, that it's even worse if you choose to live somewhere else. So yeah. it's, a, it's a challenge here. I mean, every day is a struggle. And, you know, my friend from America, she put it very, very perfectly when she says, Just doing the simplest task here is a chore. That's what she said. That's really true. You know what? She really? is right. She is right. As much as I love Egypt, living here is, you know, even if you have a lot of money and you live in the nicest place, there's always going to be some hardships that you're going to go through that you wouldn't have to experience in America. Yeah. Even to buy a food by yourself, it's really a big challenge, you know? To be it honest, is. it's actually life-risking. Like- 
yeah, I was learning like two years to go buy food by myself. Really uh, learning what the people are telling you because they are telling you a sentences, you know, not just a word. So you have to respond them if you don't want them to know that you are a foreigner, of course. So it's not yeah. really And of course, Arabic. We have to learn Arabic, at least the basic. You have to learn English Arabic. English or Unless another language. Unless you choose to live in an expat area. Like where I live in Zamalek, English is pretty common. So I honestly don't have to use Arabic that much. But, okay. you know, it is important to have this uh, because you're not always going to be in Zamalek. I'm not always in Zamalek. I still have to have Arabic when I venture out and I talk to people. I know enough to survive and, you know, that's, that's great. No, I should learn more, but I am thankful that I know enough to live. And, uh, okay, good I for you, Amira, but don't this. forget you live in Capital City, so I believe it's a little bit different, but for me, Alexandria, yeah, English is really for nothing. Okay, some people understand only in certain places, but even if they understand, they don't want to speak that much, they still speak Arabic. So really, Alexandria only is going on Arabic language, no English. I would have to agree with you, and uh, the expat population there is is very small in comparison to what we have in Cairo. So yeah, it's a totally different world there. Of course, it's language. more local and more traditional than Cairo because Cairo is more. It is, and I always tell people that, and they're like, "Really? I'm, yes, Alexandria is more conservative than Cairo, <laughs> but it's more beautiful than Cairo too, though." So. Oh yeah, I love to hear that. Yeah, it is. It's so beautiful there. I mean, you have the sea. I mean, sure, I have the Nile here. I live right along the Nile, but oh, you have the sea. Nile, I mean, but if sea I had to pick sea. which one, <laughs> the sea is so beautiful there. And the food, the Greek club. You have the Greek club, okay? Mm. <laughs> okay. Okay, back to the topics of uh, what to discuss before marriage. Um, your religion. Minutes, Amira. Let's go for no a problem. <laughs> okay. Okay, so another good topic to talk about before marriage is your religion. Uh, if you're not Muslim, if, is he going to pressure you to convert? It should be your choice. It shouldn't be forced. And are you going to be able to openly acknowledge and, you know, and celebrate your religious or cultural holidays? Those are all important to ask. Ask about clothing. Are you going to be forced to wear the hijab or the niqab if you're Muslim or not? Again, it should be your choice. Too many times I see women getting involved with, with a guy and he's forcing her to wear these things. And then she ends up either hating Islam or hating him after this yeah. horrible, like, like True. traumatic experience because of, you know, her wardrobe is being controlled by this guy. Men here should not control what you wear. This should all be on you. Of course, have some respect for the traditional area you might be in, but overall, there is no law here that says you need to cover. Hmm. Yeah, um, it's true. Like if you speak about the government, so yes, there's no law and no one can force you. So it's, but it's a good point because, you know, if she already is married to Egyptian man, so Egyptian man has the right to tell the wife what to wear and what to not wear. But as you thought, this should be discussed before the marriage. Exactly. Talk about it before marriage so you don't find yourself between a rock and a hard place later yeah. because he will try. And also, by the way, the second that you give in, he will always like try again with you with something else. So as soon as you like open the door a little bit for what he wants and it's something you don't like, he will again see that he can do it to you with something else and just see how weak personality you are. Be strong. Egyptian women are strong. They don't take no. They don't take yes. They do what they want. Yes, true. And I had a problem with this, to be honest. A big problem all my life because I'm the person like if someone wants something from me, so I will always yes, yes, yes. And here suddenly I felt like I stole TS all the time and the people started using me so hardly, you know, and I couldn't stop it suddenly. And if I thought I didn't yeah. know, so the people were surprised, oh, why she say no? She became impolite or what? And then I understand, say no since the start. Simply, if you don't like something, say no. It's not impolite, but show who you are really and go for it. Yeah, so people don't walk all over you. Weak personalities don't last long here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can speak about this. And another thing to talk about would be, um, and I see this happen a lot, it happened to me, uh, phone and social media. Are you going to be able to have your own phone or the working number in Egypt and a net package? Is he going to have a problem with you having any social media platforms? Is he going to be going through your phone constantly tracking you? If he does all this, ladies, this is a red flag. My ex-husband took away my phone when I came to his home. He took it away. I was not allowed to talk or call anyone. I wasn't allowed to have Facebook or anything like that. He took away everything. This mm -hmm. is not normal. 
They do this to trap you. They do this to isolate you because they want something from you or because they're abusive and showing unhealthy behavior. So please ensure that you do, when you do come to Egypt, you do have an Egyptian number with a net package. So you can always have a way to contact the outside world. Should you sense any red flags or feel mm-hmm. that you're in danger? Yeah, and I leaving the house. It's very important. My ex-husband also tried, you know, keeping me prisoner in the home. I was not allowed to go outside. I couldn't go shopping, meet up with friends. I mean, come on, he wouldn't let me have a phone. He's not going to let me leave the house either. I was essentially a prisoner. So Mm -hmm. if he is keeping a prisoner in the house and saying you need permission to go do this and that, I I think that's another red flag because you're not a prisoner, you're a person. and You should be able to have friends. It's healthy to have friends. It's healthy to see your family. It's healthy for your kids to have friends and go out. You should not be a prisoner where, you know, uh, if he comes from a background where the women in his family practice purda, which is exactly what that is, being a, you know, a prisoner in the home, female prisoner in the home where you're, you don't really do anything outside. You only leave the house for emergencies and things like that. Overall, Mm. this is not normal. Yeah, exactly. It's not the normal. It's important to tell it, Amira, because now it looks like we are saying the same, like Egypt is bad, but <laughs> this is only like so bad men, only so little in Egypt, let's say, but they are the bad one, the scammers one. But otherwise, there is much beautiful man who will always allow you everything you'd want. Yeah, my husband doesn't have any of these behaviors, so definitely not all Egyptian guys are bad. My husband, of course, I tell him, hey, I'm going to go out with so-and-so today. I'm going out at three or whatever and he's like okay we'll see you later you know and yeah he that's how it should be going no. out too. it's now like doesn't matter um, if it's Egyptian polite. or not but uh, the relationship of actually married couple should be about trust yeah right trust and love trust and healthy balance you have to have yeah. healthy balances exactly. controlling the other person whether it's you controlling him or him controlling you it's an unhealthy balance and it's not going to last. And if it does last, it's just going to be a roller coaster relationship full of highs and lows that will be addicting and really hard to get out of. Yeah, it could be a horror, really. You'll live through your life like this. It's not going to work. Of course not. But still, there's not that much men who are doing this, I believe. I've only, uh, well, myself was in this position and I have met a few other women that found themselves in this position Uh, One of them was on the news. Uh, I believe she was a Mexican national and she married a guy from a village and she ended up being a prisoner in his house for like 10 years or something like that. And she bore him children. And it was like a really long time. Mm -hmm. I I forget the amount, but it was like an insane amount of time. It was years. Okay. And then she finally managed to get away. Don't let this be you, you know? Yeah, this is very horrible. It's, It's... Oh my God. And another so, thing yeah. to look out for is if he's hiding you from his family. Uh, oh, of course. When you're in a relationship with an Egyptian guy, any Arab guy, Muslim guy, he should, first of all, if he's serious about you, the first thing he's going to do is take you home to mom or his sister or his father or whoever. If one of his parents is dead, it'll take you to the other one if you know one is not living. But he will show you to the family. If he does not do this and you've been with him for some time and he's still making excuses and hiding you from the family and he, or if he married you, hiding you from the family, or if he legally married you and hiding you from the family, he's not taking you seriously, will not take you seriously. And you will have a lot of problems with this. I've met women who got pregnant because of this and they had to have an abortion because of this. And, you know, maybe he abandoned the kids. You know, if she didn't have the abortion, so he just ended up leaving her. And this not only happens in Egypt, but I've had friends in Europe that had this happen to them there as well with an Egyptian national that they got married there. He just wanted the visa. She got pregnant. He abandoned her and the child. So she was being hidden from the family. And, And sometimes the worst thing ever is when the family is in on this too, and they might know about you and they all might be using you for money or a visa. That is like the, Mm. these are the worst cases, the ones that make me the most angry and the most sad, because then it's like, what do you do? You've done everything right. The family knows about you. You're married legally. You have kids and you know, maybe you are living traditional. Maybe you're even a housewife and he is providing for you, but he still abandoned you. I mean, this happens too. So it's kind of like, what do you do at some point? It's hard to determine some of the, the red flags because they're, they might be there and they might be so well concealed that you're not seeing them. So, I mean, all I can say to people is just try your best to 
you know, avoid these kinds of men, try to see the red flags when, when they're there, if you can see them, if he's hiding you from the family, please run away because that's not normal. And that is one of the worst, worst things that a Muslim guy can do to a woman here is not introduce her to the family and keep her a complete secret and waste years of her life for his own, you know, endeavors hmm. that he wants for personal gain or whatever it might be. I agree, absolutely, yes. Simply, if he's not serious, he will never introduce you to his family. That's a fact, simply. If he loves you, he will do it's it as soon as possible. Fact. Oh, yeah. Arab men are now people. That's what I love. When they meet a girl and they, they really like her and they love her, they want to get married now. I mean, not tomorrow, yeah, right today. Now. <laughs> yes, they're now people. So if you're with a guy that says, oh, you know, I think we should get to know each other for for a couple of years and then see how it goes okay next that's what i would say and i have said <laughs> this before when i was in the in the dating world before meeting my husband i have met guys that said oh so you want to get married as soon as possible huh i said yes that's actually exactly what i'm looking for and they're like well i kind of like to take things slow and maybe see where it goes in a few years and maybe you could move in with me while we wait yeah no you just want me for sex like no i'm not going to be your little sex kitten for a few years mm, <laughs> before course, you yeah. decide to make a decision that i know is going to be the answer is no because by then you would have lost respect for me because i i did that and so i would be deemed undesirable in your eyes and you know you remind me it's also important point to say that the sex should be after the marriage here it works like it is not before but after yeah overall and depending what family he comes from because there are a lot of uh <laughs> Yes, okay. a lot of other circumstances okay. <laughs> yeah there are more more liberal minded men here uh, but still even if you are no but still that, let's go to the base you should at least be gonna... engaged <laughs> at least okay I'm here, but let's go to the fact if he's gonna propose to Egyptian girl you think Egyptian family of the girl will allow to happen before marriage no probably not you see there's a double right. standard here though for four versus Arab women and it goes for a lot of different things but I have numerous friends that uh, are in very successful relationships with Egyptian men mm -hmm. both here and abroad where they live together prior to marriage so yeah it does it depend happen, but if you speak about the, the tradition so it simply shouldn't be I mean overall it's frowned upon sure yeah but okay I'm it's here. not always the case we have to finish now, but I feel still we will have a third part of this topic, right? We still have. Oh, I got plenty more. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. So we have to finish now, really, because you're out of time. You know it well. So next time. All right, we'll perfect. Continue. Okay. All right, it's thank been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah, pleasure, like always. Thank you so much. All right, Rita. thank you. <laughs> Bye.